So, um, so I'm actually not going to talk about intelligence per se, but more about the physics of life and what I think life is doing at a planetary scale, which I think will segue into some of the talks. And the main idea I wanted to get across with my talk is that the things that are happening now are maybe, um, you know, have been a, or a continuum on a scale of processes that have been happening over the entire plant's history and will continue in the future. And I'm really interested in whether there are fundamental principles of physics that are underlying that. Um, hence the title, and hopefully that will become clearer from my talk. And I was initially going to give some kind of background on, oops, now this is not actually the same thing here, hang on, all kinds of fun. So I was going to give a little sort of overview of what we're actually doing with the um, idea of this symposium, but Paul did such a nice job with it, I don't think that I actually have to do that, so that's good. Let's see if this will supersede that. Ooh, okay. Ah, yes, okay. So, um, but I did wanna just add one thing to the nice things that Paul said about sort of the context for this, is that we do a lot of workshops in the Beyond Center that are focused on big questions and really pushing the boundaries of science, but they're not o often open door. So you get a few people that are having really high level conversation, and it's really hard to make that publicly accessible. So we're kind of, we're theorists, but we're trying to do an experiment here with actually having this kind of open door format so that other people can partake in the conversation. Um, and so, um, so I am not the person that coined the term planetary intelligence. I think the earliest reference we found is actually from David from this article in 2013. Um, and so when I went to Paul and said we should do a symposium on planetary intelligence um, with the idea that David was already coming to give the public lecture he gave last night, I also did not know what I meant by that term. Um, and I've, it's been fun having conversations already um, with our visitors here because it's very clear that none of us are really sure exactly what that term means. But we think there's a there there. And so that's actually what we're exploring today. Um, and so one of the things I really liked um, that David pointed out in this article is this idea that we should be looking for intelligent planets rather than intelligent life. And so that's a very provocative concept um, because we usually think about ourselves as looking for life in the universe. And um, the big question I've been concerned with most of my career is that we actually don't really know what we mean by that statement because we don't understand what life is. And so this idea that we might actually think about it as a planetary scale process is actually really um, liberating in some ways. And so what I want to do today is kind of talk about the physics of life and how we think about life as a more fundamental concept and then how that feeds in naturally to connecting some of these ideas that people have been thinking about from the other side, like David and Adam that are going to speak later on the planetary evolution side, and then why that connects to things, thinking about AI and long-term futures. Um, so this is our planet. It's obviously a living planet. Um, and so the thing that really strikes me about Earth um, is us. Um, I, I don't think there's actually really much else ha interesting happening on Earth besides us. Um, but, um, but it is a really fascinating planet, and I think um, it's very clear when you look at something like this that this is a living world, right, if you look at the cities at night. Or, or hopefully by the end of today it will become clear that that's maybe one way to think about it. But that's not usually the way we think about defining life or talking about definitions for life. So um, there's a really famous book um, probably most of you have heard of called What is Life, written by Erwin Schrodinger in 1944. And he was really concerned with this question about trying to define life from the perspective of physics and chemistry. And so, um, so he asked the question in terms of how the events in space and time within the boundary of a living organism could be explained. And I think that's the wrong way of phrasing the question because I don't think life is a bounded process um, unless you go up to the planetary scale. And so, um, so I think um, a lot of the discussion around the way we've been talking about defining life is actually really problematic because we talk about individuals and we talk about organisms and we talk about these things that are actually, um, you know, the physical things that we observe in the world, but they're not necessarily the things that are actually there. Um, in the sense that there is some fundamental process actually organizing these things. Um, and I can explain a little bit more what I mean by that, but um, Schrodinger actually made this point at the, the end of his book, which I think was rather um, poignant and probably the more insightful thing he said rather than just asking the questions, was he actually thought that maybe other laws of physics are necessary to describe living processes. And so when we're talking about life, I think one of the questions that's really hard about life is, is it just this kind of thing we observe and it really has no fundamental structure or no, um, there's, there's no, it's fully explicable in terms of the physics and chemistry we know, and we just really haven't come up with a good definition for it, or actually we're missing additional principles. And I would argue we're missing additional principles. Um, and so um, I have a background in theoretical physics, and usually like people in theoretical physics are super proud of these kind of 
pictures of the world and that they've come up with this idea of a theory of everything. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that might be good, except for the fact that this theory of everything is a theory of everything except those things that theorize. Um, so I think part of the problem with understanding life and understanding this problem of intelligence that we're talking about today is that we actually don't have any fundamental concepts of what that is. We don't understand how that fits into our physical theories about the world. And so a lot of people make arguments that life is um, you know, a simulation or an epiphenomena, and I think that those arguments are fundamentally flawed for a number of reasons that we probably can't get into in our talk today, um, but I would be happy to debate about later. Um, but I do think that there's something um, fundamentally interesting about information and how information organizes the world. Um, so Wheeler had this dictum, it from bit, about all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. So if you think about those theorizers, they're the participants. Um, and so one of um, the ways that you might turn this around is to say that bio is from bit or bit from bio, that biology is actually the manifestation of whatever this kind of information theory concept is. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the relationship to like the way, so we're thinking about the world and like that's obviously a hard problem is the fact that we experience the world. Um, but I think there's also a hard problem in life, which is the one I've kind of started to articulate so far, but this idea um, in consciousness of a hard problem is, is that you know, it's very difficult to explain based on current principles why we have experience of the world. And I think the problem with life that's very difficult is why our experience seems to matter to the world, or why is it that information processing systems actually can perform transformations. And I'll explain what that means with an example. And so this one is actually trying to get into the context of thinking about planetary scale processes but I think um, if you look at the Earth with satellites, it's a very odd state um, for a planet to be in. Um, so David describes it as this anti-accretion. So our planet accreted a really long time ago, um, basically um, due to the laws of physics operating and chugging forward in time in the way that they do, describing you know, conservation principles and things. And then we get a planet and we get some moons. Um, and then our planet evolved for a really long time, and we had this thing called life emerge on the planet, and we had an entire like, planetary scale um, living process we called a biosphere, and that evolved through time. And at some point, there were some physical systems on the surface of our planet that extracted enough regularities about the planet to formulate a theory of gravity. Right? So they were observing the world, and they were able to formulate this thing that we call the laws of gravitation. That's a kind of information, right? It's a, it's a regularity, a pattern that we see in the world. And most of the time when we think about science and the power of science, we think about science as being powerful because it's predictive. But I think this is a really clear example of where our theories of the world are actually causal in the sense that this process of launching satellites into space could not happen without physical systems with that information instantiated. It would not happen unless you had knowledge of the laws of gravitation. Now that would be an interesting, it's an interesting debate whether it is improbable or impossible, um, but I would argue it's impossible. And so there's a lot of ways that people talk about information, but for me the most interesting thing about information is when you have these systems that can extract these regularities and then th use those regularities to perform transformations like launching satellites into space. And that's something very different about our planet. So we are the only planet we know that anti-accretes because we are the only planet that has somewhere distributed on its surface knowledge of the laws of gravitation, and then engineering systems to actually construct those objects. So, um, so this kind of a, a framework for thinking about life is very abstract necessarily, I think. And so when I think about life, I just think life is literally how information operates in the world. And so the problem of the original life is how does information actually get instantiated in physical systems and start performing transformations. And that's a very abstract way of thinking about it, but it's also liberating in some sense because it allows you to think about examples of life that aren't necessarily our canonical ones. So I'm an astrobiologist, and most people in astrobiology, when they're trying to define life, think about cellular life and they want to understand what is the fundamental principles of a cell and how do I think about looking for cellular life on other planets. So they might think about looking for DNA, they might think about looking for membranes, um, and I think that that's actually very flawed because there's a misconception about what life is in terms of chemistry. We think life is a chemical phenomena, but my argument would be that chemistry is the level or the scale of physical reality where life emerges, right? And then life is this process that happens across these different scales. And so if you're thinking about that and information organizing across these different scales, examples of life on Earth include things like cities. Cities are alive. They're information processing systems. They're globally organized over the planet. 
Social systems, alive. More social systems, alive. Multicellular systems, alive. You certainly consider yourself alive as a whole entity, not just the cells in your body, right? Chemistry happening inside your cells, also alive. Um, and so, so there's always this kind of debate in, in physics um, about when we need a new additional principles and things. And there's, there's a group of people that think that there might be such a thing as universal biology and life might be governed by universal laws. And I think in astrobiology, that's in some sense the only way that astrobiology could work is if we're looking for something we think is universal, right? If life is this quirky phenomenon and it doesn't have any commonality on different planets, then it's not really a phenomenon. Um, and so laws of life is this idea that we want to look for the universal principles understanding to understand what life is. But I think if we're talking about that problem, what we really mean is that, that, that we're actually looking for understanding the laws of information and how information organizes the physical world. Um, and so we see lots of examples of living processes on our planet, but the one thing they all have in common, um, besides this, this sort of core chemistry that these people make arguments on, but you could even argue why that exists from this perspective, um, is that they are all information processing systems. And we don't really see that in other physical systems. And if we want to try to explain what we are and how life emerges, I think this kind of idea of understanding how information interacts with the physical world is critically important. And so the origin of life transition really is this transition when we have abstractions or information or simulations or algorithms or whatever word you want to describe it, because all of our words are inadequate, um, to explain this transition. And so here I've drawn a cell, but I think one of the things that gets really interesting is that that's not really the proper level to think about it, as I mentioned. And so we have this, I this idea from Schrodinger and many people about talking about the spatial boundary of a living organism. And you do have a spatial boundary as a, a living organism, but you're not really a bounded object, right? So I am me, like whatever the me that's talking is a set of correlations through time instantiated in physical media, right? And so I have the atoms in my body that I have now, but they're not the same atoms I had 10 years ago, but there's some correlation between my states. And that's actually the phenomena that we want to explain. It's the information and the continuity of that information. I don't think there's a fundamental unit in the sense that there's like a cell is the fundamental unit of life. It's this dynamical process that's distributed in space and time about how information organizes matter. So life is not a level specific phenomena. It might emerge with level chemistry, but it's not level specific. Which means, if you want to think about what are the natural boundaries for that process, the only natural boundary is the planetary scale. And so this is where, from this information theoretic perspective, you might end up at thinking about life as a planetary scale phenomenon. Um, and it's not, so we see this, but it's probably more something like this. Um, and so this is just a network representation of all the chemical reactions that happen in Earth's biosphere that we know about. Um, this is from one of the papers that came out of my group. Um, in the last year, um, led by Harrison Smith and Hanju Kim. Um, and the reason I'm just showing this is like people are like infatuated with net network theory and its ability to describe um, complex and technological and biological systems. And it is a really powerful mathematical framework, but I think it's also really interesting because networks are this, this really intriguing abstraction that captures something about the statistics of interactions in systems. And the whole argument I've made is that what life is doing is something about transformations. And so if you want to capture that physics, you really want to talk about the statistics of transformations in physical systems and that those transformations are maybe the number of transformations that you can have is actually related to the information content of the system. So technological civilization can do a lot more than the Archean Earth can do. Um, and so I think this, this idea of thinking about what are these planetary scale networks and how are they building increasing hierarchies and structure is really interesting. And that gets into the current systems that we're building, like the World Wide Web and things that are these very abstract concepts, yet somehow seem to actually influence planetary scale processes, like global economy and moving resources around the planet. So if I look at a picture like this, um, if I'm in an astrobiology conference, I think most people will recognize that this is the living planet and this is the not living planet. Um, and, but a lot of people want to make the argument that our planet is alive because of the disequilibria that these structures on the surface of our planet create. And the argument what I would make is there's something we call in physics a dissipative structure. And so this is a dissipative structure. It's a non-equilibrium stable configuration. It's the red, great red star of Jupiter. And so that's a disequilibria system. But these kind of disequilibria we see on the surface of our planet, cities, 
are fundamentally different because they require information to architecture. There's a long history of acquisition about knowledge about the world necessary to actually construct those kind of physical systems. So this gets into some interesting things about thinking about the origin of life, because we think about the origin of life as this localized transition, that there was some magic moment when an RNA molecule came into being and started copying itself, or a cellular life first formed. But I've been really intrigued by this idea um, that doesn't originate with me. It I think uh, it's really more with um, Eric Smith and Harold Morowitz about the origin of life actually is a planetary scale phase transition, where we actually got organization of geochemical cycles, and those became sort of um, a, a planetary scale living process that then generated um, more of the biochemical architecture that we might recognize. And individuals and the things that we think of as biological actually came much later. But you, if you actually could quantify the information content of the planet, you might see that the entire planet actually changed its structure in this kind of like nucleated phase transition because there's a lot of mixing going on in different things. And so I think that's kind of a provocative idea, but I think it's also fully consistent with this kind of framework. Um, and so I've been playing around a lot with that. So if you think about when we get to the Archean Earth, it's very weird that we have complex life so very early in the history of our planet and that we find it, you know, and so like the spreading time and things pe uh, people worry about these issues. But I think the problem is that we're imposing the way we think about biology on origin of life processes and the biology we know now is a very highly architected, abstracted system, and it's not the same as, as the initial systems. Um, and so, talking about individuality, um, so I, I, um, I'm, I'm thinking about planetary evolution from this information theoretic perspective and what information has been doing at a planetary scale. Um, and so I've been working with um, uh, one of my students, Hikaru Furukawa, on this idea of major transitions in planetary evolution, which I'll talk about in a minute. But we're used to this, uh, kind of familiar about this idea of major transitions in evolution, which are associated with when we get new units of individuality. So we think in biology, individuals are important. And they are important in the sense that they're the observational structures that we actually interact with. In the same sense that if we want to understand gravity, we have to go study mass of objects. If we don't understand biology, we study individuals. Um, but it doesn't mean that the governing principle of those systems is necessarily exactly what we observe. So it took a lot of abstraction of thought to realize that gravity emerges because of the curvature of space time and the presence of massive objects and isn't necessarily directly related to the object itself. It's a property of space time. And so I think there's a property of the universe that's information theoretic or, or something about information. And that organizes systems in particular ways. Um, and so we see some manifestation of that in this hierarchy of individuality. But when you may think about what are the boundaries of that process, and maybe there's major transitions in planetary evolution, and these are not really the major transitions in planetary evolution. I actually stole this figure from one of Adam Frank's papers. Um, so he has this idea of hybrid Earths um, with a few other people, and actually having energy transitions associated with um, life transforming the planet all the way up to civilizations. And I think part of the, the picture that we're discussing is where does the information actually come into constructing and architecting these systems? Um, and so that's the idea behind this major transition in planetary evolutions. You have to think about these information processing systems on a planetary scale. And then that gets into like our current state now and thinking about artificial intelligence and where we're going. And so one of the reasons I started getting really interested in the idea of planetary intelligence is I always hear people in the artificial intelligence community talking about the control problem. But they think about control of artificial intelligence as a local problem. And I think artificial intelligence is a globally distributed system already and it's a global problem and that we're mediating a global transition in the intelligences on this planet. I'm sure Susan will talk about those kind of things later. Um, and so these systems are, are going to be sort of our progeny in some sense. But it's also interesting to me because I think one of the hard things about um, understanding the universe is always building the right tools, right? So if we wanted to understand the structure inside cells, we built microscopes. If we want to understand the structure out in the cosmos, we built telescopes. If we want to understand the small scales, we built a large hadron collider. What are the tools, the microscopes, for understanding life? I think artificial intelligence is that because you have to build an abstraction that's more abstract than yourself to understand yourself, um, <laughs> which is a little weird. Um, <laughs> but, um, but that gets back to the part about life being these, these systems where information is, is sort of this self-referential dynamic, and so there's a, a whole thing there. But, um, but I won't belabor that. Um, but, you know, there's some interesting questions that arise from this, or you can think about some planets as being more alive than others. Obviously, our planet with a technological civilization is very alive, but could you actually put these things on a scale? Um, and then I am going to end... Um, oh, I'm so fast. We're going to have time for questions. This is awesome. I have two more slides. Um, but this is one of my favorite quotes of all time, which comes from a book by David Deutsch. Um, 
And he says that base metals can be transmuted into gold by stars and by intelligent beings who understand the processes that power stars and by nothing else in the universe. And I think this is a really um, interesting quote in that it points out that so far we've been really concerned with understanding um, the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry and that there are principles that govern our universe and, our, and make things predictable and there's regularities there. But so far we don't really understand the systems that extract those regularities and can do transformations with those regularities. So the fact that there are things, intelligent beings, intelligent civilizations that have knowledge of the world and then can use that to do the same thing the laws of physics do is really interesting. Um, and is really saying something, I think, fundamental about life and what life is and what life is doing. And I think the, the, the reason that part of this is like the natural scale to think about that is that these information systems just, they, they transform the systems that they're in and they really do this up to the planetary scale. Um, and so, being an astrobiologist, um, I actually started in cosmology. Um, so I was, uh, early in my career, was working on like early universe cosmology models. But you always are see, uh, presented with this sort of pie chart of the universe and all the stuff in it. Um, and what we haven't figured out so far is like what fraction of the matter in the universe actually transforms into life or intelligence or to the higher order things like comptronium or things. And so I think this is a question of astrobiology. And it's interesting to think about like how many planets nucleate this transition where they start building these hierarchies of abstractions that start changing the dynamic of the planet in fundamental ways. And you get really different trajectories for planetary evolution when you have life. Um, and so I think that's the question that we're interested in today. And I'm going to end here so we have some time for discussion. So thanks. Adam, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to moderate myself. Okay, that's right. I forgot I was cheering now. You're already kicking off, huh, Paul? Jeez. All right. Um, the question about what, uh, obviously, about what information is, um, you know, fundamentally, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're asking sort of what, 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 what makes life different, or is life, it, is life instantiating a, a new set of physical laws? And so you're pointing to information mm -hmm. as being the right thing. Um, and so I was intrigued by, so I want to just, if you can unpack more what you think literally information is. Um, but also you talk about information and the relationship to the transformations of mm -hmm. matter. And I thought that was really interesting. And so mm -hmm. if you just sort of expound on that. like Yeah, yeah. Too. This gets into tricky territory because I just don't have the language to describe what I'm thinking. But um, but I, will, I always try my best. So, um, so I think, um, like, so, so we think about the laws of physics and we have mapping between states and, and that's sort of like the way that we describe the world. Um, but I think part of the problem is um, that we're always concerned with the microstates and not the, the sets of states and how the sets of states map to each other. And so we have something we call thermodynamics, which is an ensemble theory that we talk about, um, you know, there's, there's um, you know, an entropic arrow, for example. So the entropy of the universe should be increasing, which is an average property of many trajectories. Um, and so I think part of the problem with life is that life is an ensemble property, like we think of temperature or like we think of pressure. Um, but it's one that, um, uh, let's see, how do I describe this? Um, I'm going to start over. Um, I think, I, I, not, I don't disagree with what I said, but I think it's probably not going somewhere that's going to seem logically consistent. Um, so, so the thing that I think a living architecture is, I suppose, is um, that you have this hierarchy of information processing structures, and every time that you get a new layer in that hierarchy um, with like a new macro scale property mattering, it means that you have multiple microstate instantiations of that, which means you actually have multiple possible trajectories that that macro state can exist on. Um, and so I think what life is doing is building these increasing layers of abstraction. That means that it actually has increasing numbers of trajectories that those things actually exist on. And so whether, so the, the real fundamental question is whether those systems actually have causal control and can choose a specific trajectory to exist on, or whether they just appear to, you know, have that control. So I know that sounded very abstract and no, no, was difficult for words. Macro state. There, there's so many microstates that can instantiate the same macro state. In yeah. some sense, it's no longer the microstates are no longer the thing that's in control. It's the macro state. Right? Yes. And I don't think it's, and so a lot of people make arguments that's inconsistent with what we know of physics, but I don't think it's inconsistent, but that would be a much longer conversation. Yeah. Um, and it takes a long time to unpack that. But, um, but yeah, but you are certainly a macro scale level property. And, and I do think that you have some control of yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We have a question over here first. I think he was waiting, and then we'll go over there. Um, yeah, um, yesterday too I went to the 
uh, talk yesterday too, and they were talking about life and speaking about O2, mm -hmm. and um, there are other forms of life, like anaerobic life and awful life that also is evolved around other types of, of gases as we've seen in geysers and things now. Um, do you think that there are other forms of life that might be in other planets that may be more anaerobic or um, more with other types of gases now? Um, possibly. Um, so my first answer is I think that's the wrong question to be asking about looking for life elsewhere. But I'll give that with the caveat that I think that one of the things that we have a problem with is thinking about the life we have on Earth and then abstracting it to other planets. And so the first thing I'll say is I am not convinced that there is life elsewhere. I'm not unconvinced either. Just there's no observational evidence for it. So when you ask me if I think that there is this thing out there, I actually don't know. Um, and so my philosophy on thinking about looking for life elsewhere is to understand it at the this sort of base level of what the universal properties are. And, and anaerobic or aerobic is sort of a higher level derivative property of life for me. Um, and so, um, so it's sort of, um, um, it's entirely possible that if life happened more than once in the universe that it could be anaerobic or aerobic or whatever it is. But I think, I think there's a number of questions that we have to go through that are um, more about what life is than, than just asking about like what energy sources it uses. Yeah, I recently went to a talk on, on Jupiter and so yeah. I was thinking that there might possibly be life in Jupiter. It'd be just different than ours, so that's why I was asking. Yeah, yeah, so, so I think that's a, a, a good point. So I, I think we don't understand what life is and we don't understand what kind of chemical systems life can be instantiated in. And so I think we need to ask the question about what are the fundamental properties of life and how does that translate to different chemistries, which I think is probably what you were getting at. And then what kinds of chemistries actually can do these kind of processes, can process information or have... Yeah, I might have been asking the yeah. question wrong. Okay, that's, that's... Is that a better answer for you? Yeah. That's a better answer. Okay. Thank you. It was a good question. Yeah. Yes. Susan. Oh, uh, this follows up on Adam's question. Um, so I'm fascinated by the ontology of information. And yeah. I think there's a way I can parse everything you said, and I, I, I'm very sympathetic to it, without seeing information as itself causal. So I sure, guess it depends yeah. on what you mean by information, which, you know, information theory, right, is not altogether clear. I mean, there are no. so many debates about this, but I mean, suppose we have something like Shannon information in mind, right? You know, it's a mathematical mm -hmm. theory, branch of physics. And so, you know, when I think of information, I guess I think of mathematics, um, I think of abstract mm -hmm. entities, things mm -hmm. which, you know, in philosophy of mathematics, for example, we don't regard as being capable of causal. So what's right. causing these changes um, in states of the world is not actually the information itself, mm -hmm. just like an equation mm -hmm. itself can't be causal. An equation isn't concrete, it's not spatiotemporal. It, it it's doesn't change. Right. It's okay. uh, it's more akin to um, you know Plato's classic theory of forms, yeah. right? Um, so what's going on though is that the information is informing us. Mm -hmm. We're learning just like we're learning laws of nature. Mm -hmm. We're getting information. We're mm -hmm. deciding how to change the world. But what is changing and what is causal are the patterns of matter matter and energy, right. where so the information the, is the abstract measurement of those patterns. Or, well, one way to think about it is maybe that the information is just our representation of those patterns, but it might not be a one-on-one -on -one map with the actual pattern. So that's actually like the laws of gravitation. Like we have this concrete compression that we write down on paper and things, but the actual physical instantiation of that world is distributed over entire civilization. It's not like it's, you know, I have an idea of it in my mind, but it's causal, in my mind, it's causal power. It, it is the pattern, right? So. Um, but I think these things are really difficult. So like, so this is why I make this distinction about like science being, like we usually think about science as being important because it's predictive versus science being important because it's causal. I think um, to me, and, and a lot of people make this argument, I think this is where this, this gets, you actually point out the trickiest part of it. Like are these things just, we feel like they exist and, and it's because we are the abstractions or are they actually doing something? Um, and do, do they matter or are they just kind of riding on top of, of what's happening? And I think for me, the idea that they're riding on top and that they're just predicting properties about the world is, it seems like a silly law of physics to have. 
and that's <laughs> that's um, I, I just I, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me that those things should exist and and that's that's okay it's just it's my own personal bias and I just acknowledge that that's my bias but it's also because most people just accept that as a fact and so usually like when I think about problems I like to think about them from the perspective people aren't thinking about them and try to run it to its conclusion and I think it's really interesting that there is a different explanatory framework for why those things that might exist in that if they are causal there actually is a kind of physical explanation for it and the physical mm -hmm. explanation for that in my mind is that when we talk about things like entrop entropy and entropic forces they're not just things that we're counting states but we need to count paths or trajectories and if you actually have these kind of abstractions and things it means that you have more trajectories and so there could be an entropy mm -hmm. associated with that but only if those things are actually physical if they're not physical then I don't, I don't I don't know what the physical there's no physical force there so obviously being trained as a physicist I'm biased to think that things need to be physical and I'm physically instantiated and I don't even know what that means when I say that but it's it's the reality I live in <laughs> so yeah <laughs>